we have the honor and pleasure of having uh, Jan Steckel. Jan is head of the working group uh, Climate and uh, Development at MCC, which has become the, the European Center for, uh, for Environmental Economics. And uh, he's also a professor of climate and development economics at the uh, ETU Cottbus. His research focuses on climate change mitigation in the global south, policy instruments in developing and emerging economies, and political economy and distributional effects. So he has a PhD from Berlin, and uh, he's been a, a guest professor in Gothenburg. He's been an author at the IPCC and uh, many other things. Most importantly, he co-leads with Somanath and me the Emissions Pricing for Development Initiative, which is a part of the EFD. And he will speak about the most exciting and important topic, carbon pricing. You, uh, we will allow one or two urgent questions, but not very many. So, but but if you have something really important and urgent, then uh, feel free to jump in. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, I forgot to say the most important thing. Jan is a very good friend, and it's a great pleasure to see you here. So, floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the kind. Uh introduction and uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, yeah, I look very much forward to this talk because I think it is um, it is interesting, it is relevant uh, for research, but it's also relevant for policy making. So if we basically think about the question, how do we make climate policy work in the end, then I think we need to know who is affected and why are people affected. And I thought in this uh, webinar, I would like to guide you a little bit through, well, I mean, state of the knowledge is maybe a little bit too far flash for 45 minutes, but I still wanted to give you a glimpse of what we know and what we want to know in the future. So carbon pricing um, kind of uh, has been um, advertised by economists to be the main instrument to curb climate change, simply out of kind of a Peruvian logic that there should be something that internalizes the external costs that occur when emitting a ton of carbon. And in a way, even though economists would say, well, it is still insufficient, but in a way it has been kind of a success uh, in terms of um, lay out. So we now have 25% of global emissions being covered by carbon pricing. What you see here in this map from, from the World Bank is that it is also increasingly countries in uh, the global south, low and middle income countries that at least consider or already have introduced, such as Indonesia very recently, a price on carb. Yet, um, this map is not differing uh, between various types. Uh, well, it does differ indeed between various types, but it does not differ between various levels of carbon price. So, for example, take Indonesia, uh, there we talk about a carbon price of $2.20 per ton, which is very far away from what economists would actually think would be sufficient, which starts at, let's say, estimates at about uh, US dollars uh, 40 per ton. But anyway, uh, that's not my point. My point is that it is a, a tool that gets increasing uh, momentum. Um, and it is um, kind of also like there, there's a reason for that, because there are, there are good reasons to have a carbon price. So we know uh, we just have a a systematic literature a review of this literature in the pipeline or actually in the second round of revise and resubmit we we know pretty well that um carbon pricing can effectively decrease uh, or has effectively decreased emissions where it has been applied in addition a carbon price has uh, kind of the nice feature that it can increase a tax base and this is particularly true um uh, where, or like, this is particularly interesting in countries that currently tax 
very little, and the, these are often found in, in low and middle income countries. Uh, it has the nice feature that it can cover the informal sector uh, and it generates a very general revenue. But um, what the carbon price does basically is that it increases um, the energy prices, right? Because uh, it kind of increases the relative prices of fossil fuels if there is energy like coal, oil, natural gas that is related to carbon emissions, then it would increase basically those goods. And we know a little bit from carbon pricing, but even more from fossil fuel subsidy reforms that those price increases are often accompanied by a broad-based resistance that those immediate price increases can lead to large protests that have the power to stop the reform. And this has been very prominent, and most of you will know the example of the Yellow Vest movement in France, which was forming after a, um, a, a carbon price increase, uh, actually an increase, not the introduction, but an increase. But we have basically seen those protests all over the world, in Indonesia, in Ecuador, in Nigeria, in Iran, in South Africa, what have you. Um, and particular, if we look in the more low and middle income countries, then those protests have actually formed, despite this reform being partly progressive, that is pro-poor. So I think if we just neglect those distributional effects, who actually is affected, then we might actually run in the trap to make these kind of policies politically uh, unfeasible. So this is kind of uh, the introduction of the motivation for what I now would like to kind of tell you, what do we know about distributional effects? And you have realized that I'm motivated why I at least am, am so interested in those distributional effects because it links to this kind of policy acceptability. And therefore, let me, for my talk, give you a more theoretical framing that I here borrowed from, from colleagues from Barcelona, from Sarah Maestre Andres, who basically um, says that the policy acceptability kind of is a function of something that she calls perceived fairness. And those perceptions of fairness in the end are driven by three facts, by the distributional effects, so basically the fairness to others, but it's also important to look into the personal effects, so how does it affect me, and the procedural uh, aspects like the, the trust or the lack of trust in, in governments. So a carbon price reform would be acceptable if it would be perceived as fair, depending on how it affects those three dimensions. And then there is an additional effect, right? Because like there's a reform and we can also take the revenues um, to and recycle them uh, into all kinds of uses, into environmental use. We can actually redistribute it to households that are affected. We can do all kinds of stuff. But this, I think, gives us the the kind of the, the frame that we can think of distributional effects when we also think at the same time of policy acceptability. So this then kind of, I think, gives us three nice um, topics that I would like to, to look at into this talk. The first is, let's look into how are the lower income groups affected. So here the criterion really is distributional effects. Uh, we call this the vertical uh, distribution. The guiding question here is what cost falls on the poorest members of society. This is a topic that economists, including Thomas, have been uh, concerned about like for a long time. Um, but then the question is also like relating to this um, fairness to me, what are the personal effects? What are the hardship cases? We call this dimension the horizontal distribution and questions that guide us here are like which households face the highest additional cost? What is the cost to households which are most important to political decision makers? Because even though of course everybody from a normative point of view would care 
for the costs that fall on the poorest members of society. But from a political point of view, this might not be the most important group. It might be the middle classes. It might be people living in a specific area. It might be a very specific electoral base for decision makers. So how can we understand who exactly is affected? And then the third question relates to basically those that are hardly accessible. And here, I think um, the criterion is like the procedural aspects. How do we actually use the revenues, not only in theory, in theory, it's relatively simple. We can have like lump sum transfers or what have you, but taking the political and political economy realities into account. So the dimension here is the possibility of receiving transfers actually from uh, the government. So the guiding question here then would be which households could be compensated given a specific institutional setup. So let us look into those three dimensions now in terms of the vertical um, distribution. So the first question we can ask, is carbon pricing regressive? And we wanted to know this. Uh, what does the literature say? We published a systematic review on the literature, uh, which identified by then 53 studies in 39 countries with 183 effects. And um, we found that carbon pricing is not per se regressive. What we found, what we also looked at is what are the conditions that make it more or less regressive? And here, I think it is quite interesting to, to say three things. First is that we have learned that we find more progressive study outcomes for lower income countries. We find more progressive study outcomes compared to kind of uh, studies that do not focus on uh, low and middle income countries or that do not focus on the transport sector in this case. So we find more progressive um, uh, impacts on, on policies that focus on the transport sector. And we basically kind of find more progressive um, impacts in studies that take indirect effects, behavioral effects, general equilibrium effects or lifetime income into account. This is important to have in mind because I will continue with uh, with looking into mostly studies that look into the incidence of carbon pricing. So basically, um, the um, if you like the overnight effects, and I will come to come back to that. Um, let us look into again into this um, progressivity because I now started with basically showing you the global picture, showing you what is in the literature, showing the conditions why um, policies are more regressive or progressive. We did also a study, an empirical study based on the global consumption database by the World Bank covering 87 countries and we wanted to know okay now are carbon pricing policies are they progressive or regressive? And we looked to answer this question, this has also to do with a very special structure of the global consumption database, we looked into the income effect on the lowest uh, group relative to the national income and to the national average. So if it's basically below one, it would be progressive. If it's above one, it would be regressive. You can see that like in most low and middle income countries, the carbon price would indeed be progressive. Some countries, however, would be largely regressive, including South Africa, including Peru. Um, but what is the key mechanism then? The key mechanism is basically the differences in the energy expenditure. So um, um, basically, this means that we we find, if we look across the uh, across the globe. We find that the shape of the specific angle curve for energy expenditures is really decisive um, for like uh, for the distributional effect, and we can map this uh, for the entire world here. I think it's important to have in mind, and we come to that in a second. It's important to have in mind that this does not mean that people are not affected; they are just less affected than the national average, right? Okay. Um, so we wanted to, to know further things. So like when that do kind of carbon prices become progressive or regressive? We did a study where we in particular looked into Asian countries 
Um, and we kind of also looked into specific design schemes of a carbon price. A carbon price, if you talk to policymakers, like from an econo economic point of view, we'd say, yeah, of course, we, we tax all emissions, all sectors, same price. That would be the efficient solution. That is not necessarily kind of what you then hear in practice from policymakers. So, for example, in Indonesia, um, a country where I have been working quite a bit, like people then said, yeah, but like maybe we just start with the electricity sector, or what do you think of the transport sector, etc. So, uh, sectoral pricing schemes are quite uh, common, and you can see that um, this graph basically normalizes always the. Uh, distributional incidence on the poorest uh, expenditure quintile. So it shows you here the expenditure quintiles. The first, the poorest 20% on the very left, the richest 20% on the very right, and then different design scheme normalized to one. And you always see like what this one actually means in absolute terms um, for the poorest quintile. And what and the bottom line of this graph here, even despite like being a lot of lines, et cetera, but the bottom line here is that um, basically design matters. So it matters whether you put a carbon price just on liquid uh, fuels or whether you have a national carbon price uh, in place or whether you, in addition, also price kind of international emissions that would mean in practice you have something like a carbon order adjustment mechanism in place. What also matters is the regional dimension. So these results are for India. And they show you that the distributional effects can be very different on the regional level. But why is that important? It's important because politically, the regional level can be very important. So uh, what we did in this study is that we looked into the um, income incidence of a carbon price on the first quintile on the left-hand side. And the right-hand side shows you the difference in incidence between highest and lowest quintiles. So um, basically, if it is positive, it would be um, progressive. If it is negative, it would be regressive, right? Um, so what you can see in this, again, is the bottom line that you see a lot of variation and you even see different signs uh, across the continent. So just saying like cam pricing in India might be progressive or regressive, it doesn't really matter because um, you have uh, a federal state, you might have very strong um, sub country political dynamics and those dynamics look very different. But this is still basically looking into the vertical dimension. It is comparing are the richest more affected than the poorest, basically. But is that actually the question that we should ask? Uh, and I think it is an important question, no doubt about that. But what is also important is to know a little bit more about who is actually affected and why is that important? So this graph shows you um, the distributional effects of a carbon price in South Africa. The black lines here show you the median effects, the diamonds uh, average effects, and you can read this box plot as such that um, 70, 25% uh, of the population are above this line, 25% of the population are below this line, and the whiskers give you the fifth to 95th percentile increase. So it gives you, if you like, the entire distribution, how people in this quintile here, the poorest here, the richest again, um, are affected. And what you see is that poorer household in South Africa consume um, basically more carbon intensively, hence they will be affected more by a carbon price. Um, but um, what is interesting, if we just look into the vertical effects, that would be what we had just looked before. This would be the blue line here. If you look into the entire distribution, then you realize immediately that the within quintile heterogeneity exceeds widely uh, the the recent quintile uh, uh, the between sorry the between quintile heterogeneity. So what you what happens within the quintile is actually also uh, extremely interesting to look at, and this is something that we in the literature call horizontal inequality. And when we started to work on this, we found this 
to be a quite important research gap, particularly to think about how can we measure this and can we actually say something about this? Are there systematic uh, uh, differences between those people who are poor and highly affected and those people who are poor and non-highly affected? So um, the answer is yes, they are. Um, um, so I skip this graph um, because, uh, well, it, well, no, I don't skip this graph, sorry. Like what we did is that we built a global sample and this is why I got confused because I was hoping to, to have the graph to show you this uh, kind of uh, the, this global sample here, but it will probably come in two or three slides, but it shows you a global sample like, uh, that we collected where we really collected uh, individual countries' household budget survey data, which allows us to do very detailed distributional analysis. And we wanted to, in this graph, basically then shows you, okay, how are the vertical and horizontal um, kind of effects are um, comparing to each other. So on the y-axis, you see the vertical distributional uh, coefficient. Um, so Basically, this means kind of the highest, like the highest quintiles effects divided by the lowest uh, one. Um, then um, the same kind of true for the horizontal distributional coefficient. Um, and you see that countries in general basically can be clustered along uh, various dimensions. So countries where the vertical differences or differently the horizontal effects outweigh the differences in the vertical effects and this is most of the countries so in most countries basically we see that these horizontal effects so the within uh, the within quintile or decile kind of variation is much larger than what we see between the quintiles we also see, and this is also, I mean, this is basically confirming what I had just before, like when kind of looking how rich those countries are, then we also find that in most poorer countries and very poor countries, climate policy is more likely progressive. So um, we would like to understand now what is kind of driving those. So we we can say, okay, like if there if there is such a difference when kind of binning uh, the expenditures here, then maybe affluence is not a meaningful predictor to understand why people are affected. So we maybe uh, need to look into very country-specific characteristics. Could it be vehicle ownership or energy use or space or other social democratics? So which characteristics help explaining the heterogeneity of um, uh, these effects? So and here comes the promised slide in terms of the data set that we have collected. So we have collected a data set um, in for 87 countries, which is covering 1.56 million households. Um, you see basically there is a regional spread, most households in Asia. Uh, these countries account for 65% of the global population, approximately 70% of global GDP and 50% of global CO2 emissions. The one large country that is missing and that is kind of messing up here, uh, my stats, is China, because you can imagine that the Chinese government is not necessarily prone to give us the very detailed household budget surveys, which allow us to look very detailedly how um, income expenditures and also other measures are distributed. We couple this with uh, multi-regional input output data that we get from, uh, from GTAP for the year 2017. And now let me explain to you what we do. Um, this is actually also true uh, for all the other results that I had been showing you, but I think it is important to understand, um, so I thought I included here. So we use this household data around 1.5 million households. Uh, we have very detailed information about these households. We know basically how much they spend for in total, but also for electricity, for transport and cooking, for vegetables, etc. 
Um, then we use the input output model to derive region and sector specific embedded CO2 intensities. So this input output model gives us kind of how much emissions are related to electricity consumption in country X. Um, um, we can then um, calculate the CO2 the sectoral, this household's kind of sectoral CO2 emissions and the sum of it, obviously, and then can multiply it by any carbon price. If we know then how much this carbon price would actually kind of cost this household, we can calculate what are the relative costs. So if you see any number in this presentation on the incidence, then this is basically referring to that. It is a share of total expenditures a household would uh, need to forego, if you like, um, to cover the additional cost of carbon. In the case of our specific household here, uh, of which we uh, have a lot of specific information, where they live, how much they spend, whether they own a car, how much energy they use, which energy they use, etc. We know this would actually be 1.1%, okay? So, but this does not, uh, so, and based on this, we now basically want to analyze the horizontal heterogeneity and we use machine learning for doing this. We fit boosted uh, regression trees for each country and then we can predict households carbon intensity of consumption based on observable characteristics like car ownership, household expenditure, province, etc. So here for South Africa, our boosted regression explains 35% of uh, the carbon intensity. It's not bad. It's also not extremely great, but still we can say, okay, of this kind of car ownership explains around 40%, household expenditures only explain 20% and so on. We can then control for each of those um, factors. So how important is household expenditures uh, compared to the others over income? Um, how important is uh, car ownership? How does it kind of um, uh, distribute, etc. I don't want to go too much into the details, um, but what we basically can can get from that is that we we really know kind of what explains now this heterogeneity. And if we know this, we can start building clusters and uh, use some random forest um, uh, algorithms to do that. And we can come up basically by um, by um, in the end, nine clusters, where we can, for example, say, okay, this countries in those countries are countries that are progressive uh, in terms of uh, vertical effects. There is a large horizontal inequality for the rich households, uh, and predicting factors are electricity access, cooking fuel use, vehicle ownerships, etc. Examples for those countries are uh, Kenya, Ghana, or Senegal. If we look into a different country, then in this, um, uh, sorry, in the different cluster, like here, um, um, the, the vertical effects would be regressive. There is a large horizontal inequality among the poor. And what is explaining uh, the differences is kind of household expenditures and cooking fuel use. Examples here are Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador. What I also should say, and it is uh, not on the slide, but um, this cluster A here is basically clustering together most OCD countries. And guess where most of the research and distributional effects of carbon pricing is from? It's from OCD countries. So our understanding and our narrative on the distributional effects of carbon pricing basically is covering mostly one of those nine possible clusters. And I think this is a very important kind of insight that particular if we think of distributional effects in low and middle income countries here, for example, um, countries in, in West and East Africa or countries in Western uh, Latin America, they might actually look structurally very different than in countries of the global north. I thought that um, for this audience, um, it is interesting to look into the critical role of energy access a little bit. I mean, it's uh, maybe also linking a little bit to other talks here. 
that um, we know that many countries uh, and many people lack um, access to clean cooking fuels. Um, the access to the technology is limited. And why is that important now for um, the debate on carbon pricing and distributional effects? The answer uh, lies in, a, in this graph, which is uh, from a study from Julian Rose and, and Jörg Peters and others, which basically looked into the effect of a, um, of a fossil fuel subsidy reform in the cooking sector in Senegal, which happened, I, uh, I'm missing a, a red bar here, but like, which happened in 2008. So in 2008, Senegal decided, okay, let's have basically an energy uh, subsidy reform. What happened, is that um, all of a sudden kind of the consumption of LPG went down and the consumption of charcoal and firewood went up. And if you have in mind, basically, like all the detrimental effects of kind of using those fuels, charcoal and firewood on health, on the environment as well, uh, then this is not necessarily a policy that you might necessarily want to push, right? Um, so um, it is interesting to look into basically countries where this is um, very important um, because also firewood and charcoal uh, biomass in general is very difficult to, to tax. Um, uh, a tax would kind of increase the relative prices for clean and less hazardous fuels. So the question is, does it systematically really increase uh, uh, biomass consumption? And the answer, the short answer is it does. So possible solutions then would be that one might uh, think of, and I think this is very important, uh, to exempt cooking fuels from carbon pricing, to provide basic amounts of fuels or clean cook stove, or to address biomass consumption overall. Uh, I want to highlight a study that we basically did under the umbrella of, um, of EPFD and EFD to look into the dynamic effects of um, biomass consumption. And here we use a demand system and we model the impact of a fossil fuel price increase on consumption of biomass in various countries, including Cambodia, Ghana, uh, Honduras, India, Kenya and rural Myanmar. And what is important here is uh, you see always a change in demand in red following a carbon price of uh, I think 40 US dollars for charcoal and firewood. You can see that in most countries, look at the red dots here, it is actually going up. But, and I think this is a very important, but if you include transfers, if you manage that people actually get compensated, poor people get compensated for these additional costs, then uh, the effect is uh, neglectable or even going in the direction that we would think is normatively desirable. And this brings me to the last kind of question. And this is kind of um, how do we actually reach out to people? How do we make basically these kind of um, compensation schemes happening given uh, the specific institutional uh, setup. If we look into basically how economists would think of recycling revenues from a carbon price, then uh, this uh, study also from MCC by David Klenert and, and others have looked into various dimensions, efficiency, equity, and acceptability. And they looked into various commonly discussed schemes, including um, recycling through the labor tax, the very classical double dividend idea, uh, recycling through capital, corporate tax, uh, recycling through directed transfers uh, to uniform transfers, um, and then depending again on the optimality of the system. What they haven't looked at is the accept, ex, like they looked into acceptability issues, but they didn't look into accessibility issues. And I think this is actually quite important to look at because if you look into existing social transfer schemes, then you find that in low and middle income countries, on average, only 23.4 a percent of the population is actually covered by 
social transfer schemes, and this is a number that is definitely lower uh, than on average the people, particularly if you look here to countries, uh, very poor, poor countries in in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also other countries, this is likely lower than basically coming back to my example from before than people who use biomass for cooking. So um, what can we do? How can we increase um, this accessibility? Like one, um, um, let's start with basically an example where kind of one could use existing social security schemes to keep transaction laws. And we, we calculated it through, in the case of Ecuador, there was a large fossil fuel subsidy reform announced um, and then also executed in 2019. 20, unfortunately, was um, rea like the reaction was extremely violent uh, and anti-reformist. Anti um, we proposed in advance to basically Use the um, use the existing um, uh, social security scheme for compensation. So in red, you always see the uncompensated effects. Again, here only vertical effects are. And then option one would be to scale up the existing social security scheme. You would see that it would be would make this entire reform highly uh, progressive and even make the the poorest part of the population. Uh, better off. Plus, it would still leave uh, $370 million in this case uh, for the government. Um, we also calculated, okay, we could expand the eligibility of the existing scheme so that not only the, the poorest uh, are eligible for this uh, social security scheme, as it was the case by then, but also kind of the uh, poorest 60% of the population. And you see, it would actually become even more progressive. And then finally, uh, we, we also calculated a step to establish a new channel, like a minimum pension, which you can see, again, is even uh, more uh, progressive in a way, and only the very rich would at all be affected negatively by this reform. Um, we did that a little bit more systematically for all Latin American countries in a different paper, uh, just published very recently in, in World Development. And we wanted to know, okay, what is the percentage of the 20% the most affected households of such a reform? the poorest 20% and who has access to transfers. And you find those people that are outside of the circle, for example, here for Argentina, they would be uh, at least not having access to, to transfer, but they would also be poor and most affected. And in, in the Argentinian case, here, for example, you would have 3% of people who are poor and who are highly affected uh, of the carbon pricing reform, which do not have access to any form of social security at the moment. Or like here, uh, enlarged, this is now for Brazil, but the idea is basically the same. So there are various ways how we can um, think about this. We can think about design schemes for carbon pricing and compensation schemes to, to really think of how can we target them. Because again, I think particular in low and middle income countries, like the design of the compensation scheme and making this work is really important, not only from, from an acceptability point of view, as I started, but also from a from a welfare perspective and also from a perspective of, um, of effectiveness in the end. So one way we had been thinking of is, okay, you can take the revenues and invest in infrastructure. So, uh, and indeed kind of as a result, this is kind of the result, what kind of carbon pricing could contribute in, term, contribute in terms of the public funding that is needed to achieve the entire SDG agenda. And you can see that in some countries, including Bolivia, uh, including Indonesia, like a carbon price at a level that is considered to be uh, sufficient to um, uh, sufficient to kind of um, achieve a two degree target uh, would cover 100% of this necessary funds if kind of um, recycled back. And indeed, 
looking into this example, what would it mean in terms of distributional effects? These uh, recycling schemes would be largely progressive. This is from a study we did for Nigeria, where 60% of population lack access to basic infrastructure on electricity, sanitation, or water. And we basically wanted to know, okay, what happens if we use the revenues and spend them on infrastructure investment? And yeah, this is basically what you can see here in those gray, yellow, and blue dots. And you see that basically using this would be highly progressive, more uh, progressive even uh, compared to having a lump sum transfer to the population. Of course, um, if you think of these transfer schemes, then you need to consider that there is a huge time lag which will likely not help with respect to acceptability. So let us for the last five minutes look into the question what then determines acceptability. So we know quite a bit about vertical effects. We get kind of our hands on the horizontal effects. I think when it comes to the design of compensation, we still have a little bit of work to do because it has also a lot to do with actually the trust in government, institutional feasibilities. And here, I think in terms of new research, one way forward that we are also trying out um, also in, in uh, within EFD, uh, together with uh, Uni Andes, um, two of my colleagues will will start a conjoint survey experiment to really understand, okay, how could those revenues be used to make them uh, acceptable? Um, and I think it is very important to have this country-specific context because take this kind of, um, this table here from uh, from Canada. So people received kind of a, a, a rebate um, for funded through the carbon price. And they were then asked kind of, um, what do you kind of, what, what is your perceived rebate? And you find that it goes actually uh, both ways. Those that received a federal rebate thought actually that they received much less than they actually received. Um, but also people in some states that did not receive this rebate still thought they were kind of um, co uh, compensated. So it is highly kind of um, uh, subjective. And in a paper by uh, Duane and uh, Fabre, they actually find that this evaluation is highly uh, subjective and linked to political orientation. Um, a final note, like how to compensate actually. And as I said, economists usually kind of like um, lump sum transfers. And we did a systematic review on the on the literature on transfers and acceptability uh, and try to understand, okay, like, does it actually change public support? And we find that what is actually increasing public support is green spending. So using the revenues and, and recycling it back into infrastructure, into renewable energy, what have you. But what decreases uh, public support, interestingly, is lump sum transfers. Um, so um, I think this is still a puzzle. It will has it has a lot to do with something that I think is still not very well understood. This is a question of salience. It is a question of communication, um, and this is then not the end of the story, right? Like policy acceptability for the population does not necessarily mean anything for the policy acceptability of the policymaker. I would say there is still kind of a sensitivity on that. There might be policymakers who say, well, I don't care about the public opinion or the other way around. So I think another way that we need to understand is kind of how do people actually vote? Is there political backlash? What is the political economy? What are the lobbies? What are the interest groups? And here, I think we can get forward with conducting experiments and surveys, but also ex post literature. Okay, this is basically the end of my talk. I just use one more minute to introduce you to a tool that we have built. It's called the Carbon Pricing Incidence Calculator. You find it at, this is wrong, unfortunately, it should be C, I oh, know it's right, cpic minus global.net. Uh, you can choose your country, one of the 87 countries that we have collected. 
and it is like those countries are, are covered um, and you can look into all kinds of carbon pricing policies, including a national carbon price, carbon price in the electricity sector, carbon price in liquid fuels. You can look into various compensation options, um, how the re uh, revenues are used, whether uh, they are recycled back to the population uh, and how exactly. Uh, this is basically how it looks like. So you can really kind of tailor the analysis of distribution impacts to your needs. You can choose any combination of different household characteristics. So looking beyond uh, income uh, decibels, but also looking into, uh, if you're interested into genetic effects, you can look into genetic effects. You can look into the influence of car ownership, et cetera, et cetera. You can play around with uh, the carbon price, obviously, and, and the specific uh, scope of it, you can kind of play around with how exactly and how many, how much of those uh, are recycled back and hence simulate um, different policies. In the end, you then get graphs and analyses that you can download and use for you, also for your, uh, your own analyses, maybe also um, stuff that is going on in your country. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention stop and i stop here thanks a lot thank you very much that was a, a wonderful talk um and uh, i'll uh, moderate a little discussion now so please uh, start thinking about questions i don't see any at the moment in the chat but uh, alejandro will help me uh, find some i will start with two questions one may be easy one may be uh, more difficult so i'll take the easy one first uh, could we put your tool on the EPFD webpage and make it accessible easily for um Yeah, for absolutely. Yeah, we would love that. Good. Then a more difficult one. Um, when we um, look at um, horizontal inequity, a part of the horizontal inequity is that um, some people um, use fuel more intensively. And of course, the purpose of the carbon tax is somehow to influence those people. And and a part of, of the unacceptability is that uh, they resist this. And the, the, there can be a, a whole range of things that we might feel more or less sympathy with. I mean, there could be people who, who, who race cars for fun and use a lot of gasoline, and we perhaps don't feel a lot of sympathy with that. But there are also uh, professionals, uh, taxi drivers or lorry drivers who who, who clearly um, need fuel in, in the short run. There's no substitute. But still, they become maybe tied uh, in some cases to to the um, a sort of lobbying. You can see perhaps in some cases a joint efforts of lobbying between oil companies and trucking or transport companies. And so there's some kind of um, uh, a conflict between the uh, lobbying and uh, political acceptability on the one hand and the efficiency, which of course where you would actually like the carbon tax to have some effect on. So I'm wondering uh, how, how, how we should start thinking about those things. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a great question. I think, um... Like, for me, kind of in the end, like, well, like, I think there are various questions. Like, one is, how shall we think about this economically? How shall we think about this uh, kind of politically? And um, I would like to highlight the political kind of dimension here, because I'm, I would say I'm a bit... Well, I, I, that's not true that I'm agnostic on, on how to kind of um, compensate those people. But I would say it is extremely important to understand this. Because if you look, for example, into France, um, even though it is hard to believe now in hindsight, but back then, nobody really expected kind of like this, these large protests. And I mean, I, I understand, I fully understand that kind of like this had not only to do with the actual distributional incidents, but it was more complex. It included kind of trust in elites, and et cetera, et cetera. But 
I think kind of knowing this in advance might have helped the French government to kind of think at least also, it can be the entire range. Uh, think about communication, but also think about instruments. If you think, for example, and then this comes to the economic part of it, right? Like, I mean, of course, we do not want to design compensation schemes that kind of uh, interact negatively with the efficiency um, of things. But if you think of a of a of a lump sum transfer, which still can can often help, uh, this wouldn't necessarily interact with the efficiency. And then I think it's also our job uh, in an ideal world to kind of, uh, as we did in Ecuador, to basically go through the various options and present it. In the end, this needs to be decided not by us, but by policymakers. But we can give them information. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I see two questions here. Um, Eric and Alejandro, do you want to jump in, Eric, first? Unmute. Yes. Okay, hi, John. Nice to listen to you, as always. Nice. Um, so uh, we're having a survey with the vocational students, 800 or so, coming up soon. Um, and, uh, yeah, I th thought just to pick your brain on if you have any thing to to explore with that type of group in this space of uh, attitude to carbon pricing or climate policy or particular to that uh, sort of young perhaps not heading towards further studies but rather yeah, starting to work and you basically would would think it's interesting to kind of um, present some information to them and think what they would like and what they think would be kind of I don't know, uh, or, equity or, or justice or, um, implications. Yeah, distributional, or... sort of how their perceived distribution mm -hmm. uh, affects uh, how yeah. they perceive it or something like that. Yeah, I think those kinds of um, studies are extremely interesting. We have two kind of uh, conjoint survey experiments in the pipeline, in general population though, not kind of with a specific group where we actually plan to show them how they are, or like, like you know, have a survey experiment. So some some have the information, others don't, but but see how this kind of affects the the acceptability of the policy. So I think these kinds of questions, linking it then again to or specifically to the acceptability questions, is extremely interesting and relevant. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alejandro, and then Jonas. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Jan. That was a, a, a great, great talk. So I, I, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about uh, the, the potential that you see uh, in terms of looking at other aspects from this, right? Like the, the possibility that uh, some of the reactions or, or the, the perception or the reaction that people have to these policies might be related also to kind of their their beliefs or their experience with climate change, right? And and how. Uh, no, they, they see it as something that is salient you know? and, and I ask because I've been trying to to combine you know, these kind of things with the experience to extreme weather events and other issues so I, I would like to hear your, your take on this I think it's an interesting question and I don't I haven't seen any uh, study I remember that like uh, together with Thomas and also some we had discussed kind of studies in this realm to basically link kind of whether people are actually impacted or had recently been impacted maybe by by climate impacts and then like how does this, this kind of um, affect the, the acceptability um, for climate policy. However, I think like for the acceptability of these specific policies, um, what matters a lot is kind of trust in government, um, trust in institutions, communication, kind of let people know, okay, like, like, why are we doing this? And uh, not necessarily in the context of low and middle income countries, but I can tell you also from Germany that people simply don't understand why we propose a carbon price. Like the very fundamental kind of mechanisms of uh, economics that for us are kind of clear, okay, we have a tax because we want to steer the behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Like this is not clear. So I wonder like, you know, like, um, uh, whether if, if you're interested in how do people think about um, uh, climate policy after having been kind of impacted by, by a climate impact, 
uh, then asking them particularly about a specific policy instrument might kind of you know bring in additional factors that you that are hard to control for but generally i think the question is really interesting and Jonas. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Jen, uh, for excellent presentation. Uh, I, I enjoyed listening to your talk. Uh, uh, probably, I want to ask a quick um, social justice kind of uh, related question. I know the focus of the paper is, or the study is, to see what would be the impact of carbon taxes, uh, the distributional impact. But we know from standard kind of demand analysis that these kinds of things most of the time, for instance, you impose a new tax, it's like a Peruvian tax that will raise the price of not only fuel, the fuel is a problematic uh, commodity in terms of household budget share, because the moment you raise the price of fuel, it would lead to a general food price or general uh, inflation increase. So in with that understanding, what I wanted to ask is, like I indicated, this might not be the direct objective of the course, his, the analysis, but we know historically the West is responsible for climate change, and there is climate uh, compensation, uh, damage compensation funds uh, issues. How could those kinds of funds um, be channeled, or is there any scope for, to use those kinds of funds to ease up the burden of climate uh, these carbon taxes on the poor. Do you see any scope? Uh, I mean, I know I understand this yeah, is not the yeah, main yeah. purpose of this. No, no. I mean, we we had been thinking about it. Like we even have a paper on this, and back in 2017, I can send it to you, where we basically proposed the following: we propose to kind of use these funds to help countries to implement the necessary policies, but then help them to kind of cover the incremental policy cost, if you like. So basically set up uh, an infrastructure for compensation that is actually working. And this is costly, right? Like, I mean, uh, like setting up kind of social transfer schemes in, you will know this much better than I do, right? But uh, in Ethiopia, I presume is is not like, you know, this is nothing that you just do overnight. You have to carefully think about this. You have to think about targeting errors. You have to think about all of these things. And this requires funds and it requires institutions. It requires capacities but why not kind of using kind of funds to help countries to build this to build this infrastructure and then regulate kind of and bring forward kind of the necessary policies including kind of a uh, carbon price including fossil fuel subsidy reforms but making sure that the poor are kind of um, protected i mean i might be naively liberal in this regard because i think it, 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 had, it, it would have an additional kind of um, advantage because countries then generate revenues from, from this new tax and what they do with those revenues they, they can decide themselves right like i mean it's not us or like the international community through the global climate fund to tell them yeah you must only use it for wind park x y uh, but they like it's it's up to them so um, I do think that there is kind of, in theory, like there is a way to reform oh. this institution. Whether like, you know, this is a highly political process. I had been discussing this very recently with the German Foreign Office and the people who are sitting on the board of, the, of this fund. Um, they say this is really like, it's a long way. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. I, I, there's no other question, but I'll ask one um, sort of more personal. We're, we're doing a survey in, in five European countries, and we wanted to, with one question, capture something about who is horizontally affected at the individual level. And so without having thought very much about this, but the, the first thing that comes to mind is a question like uh, if... Um, We've asked people. We've asked them how much they think uh, they would be affected by an increase in fuel prices, and we've talked about the average. And we then have a question: uh, <clears throat> We would like to hear uh, why you think you might be more or less affected than the average person. Please tick the appropriate boxes. And then we have more because I have to commute. I live remotely and have to commute. More because of health reasons more because I have an old-fashioned oil heater, uh, 
and and then less because I like to take the bicycle and I'm very flexible. We have like five or six options. Do you think this is um, a viable approach to try to self-identify horizontally affected persons, so to speak? Yeah, I do. Uh, and I mean, you could even go a step further because like, I mean, for European countries, we basically know who is affected. So you can kind of, you know, refer this back to like how accurate their estimate is. And that would definitely be interesting. Um, yeah, we also have a, a survey in the pipeline with the partners from LSE, where we kind of also would like to, well, not necessarily the same question, but kind of, you know, understand a little bit how people like react to 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 giving them this information like how exactly are you affected and um, compared also to others in your income group etc cetera, etc cetera. but i think kind of this um like combining this work then with surveys generally is um, or horizontal uh, questions in general with surveys is a promising road forward I don't see, uh, let's see, um, yeah, I don't see uh, any other questions. Anybody have a last question and just uh, unmute and jump in? Otherwise, we will end there. It's. Uh, I think we were supposed to end at 3, and it is 3.02. So uh, thank you very much, Jan. It was a, a great seminar, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Um, all the best to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jen. Bye.